This is Lester Smith reporting. Next news as it happens. Next scheduled news at 11 o'clock. Over WOR Radio 710, the talk of New York. singing good, you know, really. <laughs> hey, I, 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 did you see, there was a picture in the paper here the other day of, uh, you know, just to, to start right out here and get right at the nitty gritty, which in our world today is showbiz. Our world is based on showbiz, it really is. In fact, sex has become showbiz, crime has become showbiz, showbiz has become showbiz, uh, you know, it's all, it's all showbiz in the yard wide. It always was, you know, that's a uh, I think that's why people in the beginning uh, got involved in all kinds of religions. Unbelievably theatrical. You know, it takes one heck of a magician to turn somebody into a pillar of salt. I'll tell you that. That's a scene. I'd love to have seen it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, water is parting and people, oh, wow, burning bushes. I'll tell you, that's all showbiz. And uh, you got to accept that. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's part of uh, the pageantry of human existence. Right, gang? The agony and the thrill of defeat. Uh, but uh, I must say that uh, the other day I was looking in the paper there, and there's a picture in the paper of, of Burt Lancaster. And, uh, hello, wait, let me let me adjust this thing here. And Lancaster looks almost exactly like uh, the, la the late, in the later stages of his career, uh, Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's got a giant white beard, you know, he's got that uh, baseball cap bit, you know, and he's going into that whole scene there. And I guess guys get into that avuncular stage, <laughs> you know, and they, like they see themselves as the, as the, uh, you know, the great sage. And uh, so he he was talking about, you know, the fact that this TV show he did, they're going to run it on six successive weekends in the summertime, and he's really bugged. He says, "Who the heck hangs around and watches television in the summer?" Well, uh, TV freaks. <laughs> I mean, I know people who who look forward to their two week vacation now. So they can watch television 24 hours a day. They don't have to interrupt it by going to work, you know, all that stuff. Oh, yeah, it's madness. But uh, Which brings up the point that my television show goes back on the air the 12th of July, in case those of you who missed it the first time around. Yeah, it's on the PBS, which uh, locally here, I guess, is 13, right? And, uh, of course, I don't know what time they'll broadcast it locally. It goes on the network the 12th. And they tape it, uh, you know, some stations will play it at 2 in the morning, Others will play at the, uh, you know, opposite canon, uh, you know, and all the rest of it. So it's going to run through October. So, uh, you know, there's, there's some hope for the summer then, right? Sure, what the heck. You know, speaking of, uh, <laughs> of showbiz, hey, do you know that there's a town, uh, my, my spy out in, uh, 
out on the West Coast. He sends me these great uh, uh, dispatches, you know, from the underground. He's, uh, he operates a submarine, this friend of mine, and uh, he's got the only submarine in Palm Springs, California. Uh, it's, uh, it's not much business, actually, you know, it's a, de it's a desert out there. And uh, so he thought it would be a big tourist attraction, but it isn't. And uh, he takes people on, uh, you know, rides and stuff. He's got the only submarine I know that operates on wheels. Uh, yeah, he found out there was no water at all around Palm Springs. A heck of a disappointment. So now all he does is he just drives around and uh, people get in and they put the periscope up and, you know, and he hollers, uh, fire four tubes, you know, or, or uh, blow out the torpedoes or whatever they holler, you know, up periscope, down periscope, dive, dive, you know, doing, 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 the bell goes. And yeah, it's very exciting. But he, he keeps me informed of what's happening out there, see. And he says that, here's a piece that he sent me from the L.A. Times, and uh, it's from Kelso, California. Well, you know who Kelso was and is. Yeah, Kelso, you know, the great horse there. Uh, sure, Kelso. Uh, Kelso, uh, speaking of Kelso, one morning I was uh, I was out at the Belmont Park at 5 o'clock in the morning one morning, and I tell you, that's morning. Oh, boy, I'll tell you. And all these uh, these guys wearing, uh, it's a, no matter what kind of weather it is, see, the, the, whether it's middle of summer, whether it's middle of winter, the racetrack types, the real racetrack types, which are little short, heavy set guys, always wear dark suits and uh, fedora hats, which you think probably went out of style with Jimmy Cagney, but not so among the real racetrack cuckoos. They sit way up in the dark part of the stand up there at 5 o'clock in the morning with these big binoculars. And uh, they watch everything that moves. I saw one guy, for example, with a stopwatch, and he was clocking a mole that was crossing the track. And, uh, you know, I told him, I said, say, uh, <laughs> I says, what, what's with the mole? He said, you never know when he's going to run. And I said, oh, okay. And I have to keep track of everything out there, if I may use the phrase. <laughs> you track, track, you get it uh, well, really good. So uh, <laughs> that's worse than Phyllis Diller. So uh, nevertheless, uh, he uh, he was sitting out there, see, tracking his mole. So I, I uh, walk out on the track there, see, and the, was nice and soft and kind of gooey. They had just uh, run the rake over the thing, see, and it rained a little bit the day before. And all of a sudden, I hear, blum, 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 and I see coming right at me is Kelso. He's out there on an extended run, and he goes, Parent past me. I'm one of the few people you know who has had mud kicked in the face of himself personally by Kelso, one of the great horses of all time. So, you know, I, I enjoyed that. So a couple of months later, I go back out there, and I got mud kicked in my face by another great horse, Kerry Back. Now, you know, I, you know what I think would be terrific, how they have, uh, you know, how they have uh, uh, All-Star Day, not All-Star Day, really, but... Uh, they have old timers day out at the ballpark, you know, and they bring back all these old third basemen, and uh, yeah, they, they always, uh, you know, they, they hear the PA system is always is constantly in the little echo chamber now, you know. And now, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, number seventeen, a great all star second baseman who played from the year nineteen twenty two to nineteen thirty seven. Number thirty seven coming out on the is field now. Let's give a hand to Charlie Geringer, the great shortstop and second baseman for the Detroit Tigers. You don't know who Charlie Geringer is and was. Well, he was a great second baseman. He was the carry back of second baseman. <laughs> See how fame is? Well, th that's the trouble. See, half the crowd sitting out there are all Mets freaks. And, uh, you know, all they do, they don't, the only time they go to the ball game is when it's uh, T-shirt day. So they don't know what from baseball, you know. So here you are. You're introducing Charlie Garingen. They don't know what they're seeing. You know, they see this old guy with the white hair. Uh, but nevertheless, I think, uh, you know, everybody in baseball recognizes that the all-star or the all-old-timer game is a big draw, see. So there's and, – and television, of course, goes in for that. It's big. I mean, uh, every couple of days it seems like they're bringing back George Burns, you know, and they, they bring back Groucho and – and, uh, you know, they wheel these old guys in, and they, they, they make their little funnies, and then and they wheel them out, and everybody cheers. So it's all part of that scene, but it, it doesn't seem to be part of racing. And can you imagine the day when you go out to the racetrack, and uh, they've announced that before the big race, they're going to have all these old-timers day, and uh, led by, say, Secretariat, 
They just walk around the track in their original colors. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be a great idea? You see, uh, ri uh, and riding him would be, of course, a jockey who rode him during his great period of uh, winning. So here's a. Uh, you know, here's Ron Turcotte out there. He's riding uh, Secretariat, and they bring Kelso. You know, Kelso's around yet. Nashua, uh, Kerry Beck. Uh, boy, wouldn't it be fantastic? Each one, you know, dressed in his own original colors. I don't mean race them. I, you know, just take them around there, you know, and people would cheer. I'd I, I, I pay to see that, you know? <laughs> I really would. And I'm not, a, I'm not a betting freak at all. I just love to watch horses. That's all. Oh, yeah, I used to date a lot of horses in my time. I'll tell you. In fact, still do. But uh, nothing like going out uh, to, a, to a track, you know, watching those boy. Uh, but a secretariat is a beautiful horse. But I'll tell you this. Speaking of great horses, I had... Now, uh, I hope I'm not boring you with this horse scene. Before we go any further now, this is, <laughs> this is just coincidental. And uh, very coincidental. And we just happen to have, and it just came about, we happen to have a commercial here for Belmont Park. Now a word from the New York Racing Association, Belmont Park. Would you please hit the button? Out beyond the concrete and the traffic jams, there's a special place where the grass is green, where there are beautiful trees, a park to eat your lunch in, and a chance for a little excitement. The excitement of seeing some of the fastest animals in the world in competition. Thoroughbred racing at beautiful Belmont Park. A 45-minute ride from Midtown gets you away from everything. Belmont Park, any afternoon except Tuesday. First race, 1.30. Oh, well, that's, I like that. <laughs> but uh, seriously, uh, have you ever had the chance, uh, ever, uh, to uh, to involve yourself with, a, with any kind of a real champion? Uh, a lot of people, you know, they'll see a champion on, on TV or something, and uh, they're kind of, uh, uh, they're remote, of course. Uh, they're always being interviewed by Howard Cosell, who is always asking them about their religion, uh, you know, various, very pertinent facts. He never asked them about their left. Uh, you know, Hello, Muhammad Ali, it is said that you, you know, and uh, never get down to just, uh, you know, what he's doing about that left hook. And, uh, you know, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, the, the fans don't want to know any of these technical things. So, uh, unfortunately... So, one time, well, I, I've been involved with a couple of champions. Uh, one time, I'll tell you, one time I sat and had dinner, a very odd evening, with a man who was the National League home run hitting champion. He ran, in other words, he led the league, oh, maybe six or seven times, uh, hitting home runs. And uh, we, were, we were sitting there, and we were both uh, that night eating uh, stone crabs, in case you want to know what the uh, champions don't necessarily eat Wheaties. He was eating stone crabs cold with cold uh, uh, mustard sauce. Very elegant evening with a little white uh, Alsatian wine. It was kind of a nice evening. We were sitting there, and uh, he was discussing. Uh, we never talked much about home runs, but uh, he had hit uh, all these homers. And he really was a legit champion. So, uh, but then, then a, a couple of semesters before that, speaking of champions, I was, uh, I just walked into a party one night, and a bunch of my friends were everybody hanging around, you know, eating the Frito-Lays and uh, hollering at each other and yelling and the smoke and all that, and in the middle of the crowd, uh, I, I found myself suddenly talking to this guy, and then it dawned on me who it was, the ex-heavyweight champion of the world. Who was that? No, for God's sakes. You're going back to the year 22. <laughs> Good God, John L. Sullivan, what are you talking about? <laughs> Who the hell do you think you're listening to? <laughs> no, it was Floyd Patterson. And uh, he was, you know, he's, uh, you know this, 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 he had just uh, sort of uh, packed it in, and he wasn't anymore, you know, he wasn't champion any longer. But he had been champion. This is WOR New York. But now, the only, the only champion that I personally have been involved with in action was really something. Uh, one time, twice, two, two, uh, twice, I've had actual experiences where I was involved with a champion. Uh, one time, I was playing in a in a uh, pro am golf tournament, and you know when when they assign uh, you to a quartet, a foursome in the pro am tournament, it's done usually by lot. In other words, the names are drawn. See, so that's all there is to it. 
So I I, uh, I came out to the golf course. This was down in Florida. So I came out to the golf course, and I you know I figured I'd get uh, some guy that's uh, you know. Uh, running a 249th on the on the tour, or maybe some guy who last year was kicked off the tour, but he's been called back to fill out the field and that stuff. And I couldn't believe it. Uh, Shepard has just drawn the U.S. Master Champion, the, the guy that had just won the Masters. <laughs> and I made mean, one of the great money winners of all time. Let's put it this way. He was known at one time as the Bear, the Golden Bear. Right. So, uh, you know, he's very cool. And uh, I said, how are you? He said, oh, you know, it's okay. And I said, uh, well, yeah, well, oh, that's the way I am. He said, uh, well, you know. I said, yeah, okay, you know. So we got into the golf cart. It was kind of nice. See, it's kind of nice to be going around. And our ba- our bags were right together. See, my golf bag was bumping up against his. And if you were more than 20 feet away, you couldn't have told a difference. They looked just as good. As, you know, your golf club looks just as good as anybody else's until you take it out of the bag and hold it, at which point, uh, <laughs> but the, here it is, you know, he's got this old battered bag, I got my old bag there, see, we're riding along there, and uh, there's only one problem when you're dealing with that kind of a situation, see, uh, generally when you're just out there playing with your friends Aki and Al and that kind of stuff, see, you can hold your own, you know, you feel pretty good about what you do, you get off a good one, you know, and uh, so... Shepard Shepherd gets up uh, by the luck of the flip of the coin. Who's up first? Yeah, that's right, which is really bad news. So I step up to the tee there, and, of course, 27 million people are out there, see, and because uh, uh, they want to see him, naturally, see. But there I am. I'm first up, and he's he's behind me, you know. He's waiting. He's got his uh, driver there, and I look down the fairway. It's a 597-yard hole, you know, way like in the next county. I can see the flag down there. And they had more traps. I want to tell you, you had a feeling they were trying to catch wolverines or something there. They had a trap line that wouldn't, just wouldn't stop. You know, there were there were little uh, potholes with uh, with water around them. Some of the potholes had alligators in them. Uh, some had piranha fish in the water. They had everything. See, so <laughs> and and I might add that the rough had grass in it, maybe eighteen, twenty feet high, and uh, the 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 actual fairway was maybe six or seven feet wide. Just like a <laughs> wow, because you know the pros play there. See, they don't have to slice or hook or anything. So Shepard gets up to the tee, see, and I address the ball. I look around at the crowd. There's a ripple of applause. Uh, they had mistaken me for Orville Moody, uh, at which point I, I kicked the dirt a little bit and spit. And uh, <laughs> see, because uh, there had been a mistake in the scorecard. So at that point, Shepard takes his first swing. Well, you know, there are times when man rises to... You know, they always say that a, that a man that gets elected to the presidency rises to the occasion. He becomes another man. Well, no, that's true. They do. I say, no, both good and bad. That's going to surprise a lot of you. No, that's right. See, we tend to think that, uh, oh, well, when you say he becomes, another, he, he becomes a better man. Not necessarily. I've seen people turn into absolute maniacs the minute they were appointed manager of a radio station or something, yeah. They they started out, well, you know, the kind of guy that put dollar bills in the collection plate and all that. And uh, six days after getting to be manager, they're grabbing dollar bills out of the collection plate when it goes by, you know. Hey, give me that money, you know. So uh, they, they, they <laughs> pressure turns you into something else. So Shepard walks up to the tee there, see, in the crowd, a ripple of applause. And before we go any further, please hit the money button, please. Yeah, let's sing it out. You're hanging on tenterhooks, aren't you, there? Hey, right, Shepard brings his own tenor hooks along. Someday, Someday you'll own, I say it. I say it, and you'll own. Sooner or later, you'll own the generals. Yeah, for 60 years, General Tire has been one of the nation's leading tire manufacturers, but General Tire means more than tires. They have this one-stop car care center, which is staffed by experts who know how to take care of your car, not like you. Whether it's wheel alignment, wheel balance, a lube, uh, lube, it says little umlaut over there, lube and oil change, mufflers, shock absorbers, brakes or batteries. No, that's batteries, I'm sorry. But they do all this stuff down at your general tire. One-stop service. So look into your yellow page and ask for them. Sooner or later, I say it, sing it. Sooner or later, Sooner or later you'll own generals. And the sale of the year is here. Lafayette Radio's warehouse clearance sale. If you're a stereo cuckoo bird, 
Uh, here's your chance. Once a year savings at Lafayette on Pioneer, Marance, uh, Marantz, Fisher, Panasonic, Sony, all the big names uh, at a tremendous price uh, discount, the big, big sale. Once a year they have a sale like this at Lafayette. They call it their warehouse clearance sale. Get rid of all the stuff in the back there where the cobwebs are beginning to form. Here's your chance to clean up, buddy. Let's see. Uh, they're at 45 Warren Street in Manhattan. Also in Brooklyn, Flushing, Syosset, Scarsdale, and Paramus, New Jersey. Your six Lafayette Electronic Shopping Centers. And if you don't know where one of them is, look it up in the book and give them a call. They'll tell you where to look for the Warehouse Clearance Sales Center. What are you doing this weekend? Are you going to see a disaster movie that wasn't meant to be one? Are you going to wait in line to be overcharged and underwhelmed? You can plan your weekend with the Village Voice. The Voice tells you now what the others tell you later about films you won't want to miss. Rock groups on the way up, off-Broadway, off-off-Broadway, dance, concerts. We'll even tell you what you can see for free. In the best entertainment town in the world, you need the best entertainment guide. Pick up The Voice at your newsstand now. The Voice. The voice. The voice. The voice. Something to think about. <laughs> well, The Voice is getting Madison Avenue, ain't it? Dee Dee Moe, wait till it gets, uh... Mason Rudolph and uh, Alexander Squirby, the village voice for the people who think in this town, all seven of you. And now, let's hit the button once again. With all the publicity surrounding the new individual retirement account for people not covered by pension plans, you might think that the road to riches was just a matter of filling out a newspaper coupon. Well, nothing's ever that simple. The East New York Savings Bank believes that you deserve individual help in planning your IRA program. And now, through their exclusive pension specialist service, it's yours without charge. You'll be able to select the most productive savings plan for your IRA dollars. You'll get invaluable data on IRA tax provisions. You'll learn which family members qualify. There's a lot to discover about the pension specialist service at the East New York Savings Bank, and here's how. Just call area code 212-354-0508. That's 212-354-0508. An East New York representative will arrange a personal planning session at the most convenient office. That's the individual approach to the individual retirement account. The East New York Savings Bank, member FDIC. Remember, call 212-354-0508. Okay, you want to hear what happened <laughs> on the first tee? <laughs> there must have been 120,000 people there. I'll tell you. Have you ever have you ever done something which you generally do in absolute private, followed by something they call the gallery? Oh, I'll tell you. You know, I'm I'm used to that in showbiz. You know, when you perform before thousands of audiences all the time, that's something else. But when you're doing something that you ordinarily do, and you're a little covert about it, uh, if not apologetic, and suddenly you're followed by crowds of people. <laughs> you know. It's like everybody all has all come out to watch you take a shower. And, uh, you know, they applaud every time, you know, you grab the life boy and all. So, anyway, I, I, uh, I, I walked up to the, 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 the tee. See, there was a ripple of applause. I turned, you know, and I, I, you know, I flicked my sunglasses down like all the pros do. And, and uh, I had these shoes with the spikes. Uh, the whole work, see. Oh, yeah, with the gloves, all the fancy gloves. In fact, one of the great things about this pro-am was that they gave you the shoes. Yeah, that was the gift they gave you to come there and do this thing. See, so everybody, so my shoes were absolutely the same shoes that were being used by this great pro. He had the same kind of shoes, and uh, they were they were white, and they had this great big tongue that hung down with a gold thing on the front, you know, that says Pro Am. And uh, I had the glove with the with the white. With the, in fact, it was red, little kind of had little red stripes on it, and had a great big gold seal on the back. And and I uh, walks up to the they they gave everybody. Uh, a dozen balls, too, see, with it said Pro Am. Well, this is a very official thing. See, it's stamped on a commemorative Tony Lima Pro Am or whatever it was, see. So I, uh, I steps up to the tee and I places my, uh, $17 ball down there and I spit in my $9, uh, glove and, uh, you know, I kick my $74 shoes into the dirt and, uh, you know, I flexed my, uh, my $3 driver and, uh, you know, the one that I got at Montgomery Ward. Uh, <laughs> so I, <laughs> well, <laughs> let me tell you this. I'm telling you, there's something to this presidential idea. Shepard leaned into one right down the fairway, see, and it was a zinger. I caught a hole of one of the best shots ever hit in my life, see. Well, I really laced it one, see, right down the fairway, see. And the the, the gallery, no no comment. They just sort of looked. 
And uh, I really, you know, I really leaned into it. I just felt good about it. I just really belted it. And as I turned around, my partner, see, the big pro, as I turned around, he says, uh, he says, well, you'll get warmed up later. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you'll get warmed up. <laughs> He was serious, see, and I thought, what? You know, it, it was the best shot I'd gotten off, you know, since I was about, you know, nine years old. I really laid one out there, see, so he turned, he was very calm. Well, I did not realize the import of his words, you see, until he got off his drive. Well, I just want to tell you, friends, have you ever stood next to an F-11 when it's taken off? You know, that rush of air and that scream and all that? Well, that's the sound of his driver. I mean, he just he just had that neat uh, swing, and it, it gathered momentum as it uh, uh, down. It went faster and faster until it went, whoosh, you know, that kind of goes, whoosh, whoosh, you know, there's a little click whoosh, like that. And I just saw that ball. I mean, my ball where it was. See, I'd really hit a good one, and I even got a good roll. See, well, his ball had just begun to climb when it was going over mine. Holy smokes! I realize that many are called, but damn few are chosen, friends, in that league. <laughs> I mean, so, well, I did do one thing, though. I'll tell you this, see. So we, we're going all the way around, and Shepard is being very discreet. And, and, you know, it was a great feeling because now he's giving me tips, which, boy, I'll tell you, can you imagine what it would cost if I tried to pay him for that, you know? So he says, listen, he said, uh, he said, watch you there. He says, uh, he says, uh, I want you to, he says, next time, he says, just bend your knees a little more. He said, drop your knees a little bit there. He says, you're standing a little too straight. He said, drop your knees a little. And he says, uh, he says, no, wait a minute. He says, uh, give me a practice swing there now. So I go, you know, woof. And he says, uh, well, he said, okay. So I'll tell you what you're doing now. He says, he says, uh, watch that left wrist now. He says, here. And so he reaches over and he grabs my wrist. And he squeaks it, you know. I said, oh, Wow. He said, okay, so now, now try it. He says, now hold that wrist. And so, so, well, I, I, you know, I felt kind of great about that. See, he was doing it in private. See, the, the gallery had not caught up with us when they, they figured, you know, we were just having a friendly chat. So the, the gallery caught up. And here was Shepard now. He's, he's laying, uh, in a trap. Uh, well, I spent a good deal of time laying in a trap there. I, I, uh, you're, you're listening to a guy who's made a specialty out of getting out of traps. And, uh, no, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I did. <laughs> really, that, that, that's a trick, you know, you know, the whole business of two inches back of the ball and all. See, so Shepard is back in this trap. I couldn't even see the, the pin. And, uh, I'm about, uh, roughly about 60 yards out of the pin, me 70 yards, 75 yards away from the pin, but in a trap off to the right and deep. And, uh, you see the, the, uh, the green was on a hill that, uh, was a, was a pitched green, see, that went, only pitched away from the tee, strangely enough. You had to hit it over a lip and down, say, the real mean hole, see. And on the other side, it had a water hazard. It was kind of crescent shaped. So if you, if you pop this baby over the, over the green, you know, it was good by ball, see. Either that or you get out the flippers and the snorkel gear and you start playing it from the bottom. So, uh, <laughs> I'm way down in this hole, see, and, you know, nobody's paying any attention to me, obviously, see, so I'm, it's my turn to shoot, so I see this guy's head come over to, he's already, you know, he's on in two. Well, after all, it was a 700-yard hole, he had to take two shots, at least on that one, so he's on in two, see, so I'm, I'm, I'm laying about 48, and I'm down on the, in the, in the, in the sand down there, and the ball is half buried, see, and I'm very embarrassing to be holding up people of that nature. I mean, it's it's really discouraging to to have have the the, the quartet behind you. You see, is Lee Trevino. <laughs> Trevino hollers something like, "Hey, uh, Senor, to we play through, huh?" You know, it's not bad to have uh, Lee Trevino play through you. You know, so I'm I'm down there. But it's kind of, it's even better though to have to to have to ask to play through Lee Trevino's quartet. That's even better. You know, you holler, "Excuse me, are you down in trap, Lee? You mind if I go through?" You know, that kind of it really makes you feel good. So. I'm down in the trap there, see, and the guy looks down at me. He says, uh, "He says, okay." He says, "Line it up on that tree over there." I said, "All right." So I I, I look down in the sand, and there's there's this whole big ring of people all around the the green. See, I'm afraid I'm going to brain somebody. So at that point, Shepard says, "Well, here goes nothing," and I've got the uh, I'm, I'm using my wedge. See, and I go, I dig in, boom, you know, sand, whoop. 
And I, I, <laughs> I'm coughing the sand. The ball is gone. And I, I just see it disappear into the cloud of sand. There's a brief pause, and I hear this. Wah! Shepherd holds out from 70 yards out in the trap. Well, <laughs> everything I did from that day on was anticlimactic. Didn't matter. In fact, uh, this was on about the eighth hole, something like that. See, when I got back to the clubhouse, and there's this big crowd at around the 18th green there, you know, and, I, and uh, that's a great feeling, isn't it, with the 18th green laying down there, and you're this, this, you see this enormous gallery down there, and you're driving into that green, see. So, nevertheless, I go to clubhouse, and this guy comes up to me, and uh, later on, I, I, he, incidentally, later on, he's, he's, uh, he's a big deal on the tour now. Or, you know, semi-big deal. One of these guys that's always around 8th or ninth. You know, those, there's at least 30 golfers named Tommy. So, uh, yeah, so I, I uh, this guy comes up to me, and I didn't know who he was. He had this green T-shirt on, and uh, sort of bronze guy. And he says, hey, he says, are you the guy that holed out on the 8th there? From the uh, trap to the right of the green there? 65 yards out? I says, yeah, yeah, I, I guess I am. He says, boy, he says, I heard that was one hell of a shot. He said, uh, what'd you use? I said, well, I, I use my, uh, Ben Hogan type, uh, wedge here, which, uh, yeah, let me, let me take a look at that wedge. He says, hmm, yeah, not bad. He says, uh, you mean you hold out with this? And I said, uh, yeah, I did. And, uh, we kind of, you know, it's kind of nice to, to exchange little, uh, professional tips like that. He said, uh, he said, uh, do, do you dig your uh, back foot in? He says, do you, or do you, do you hold it loose? I said, well, I uh, prefer to dig it in. I, I dig in, you know. I said, uh, after all, I was going for the pin. I, 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 I knew I had to get in the pin at that one. Say, I wasn't just trying to get up on the green. He says, oh, yeah. He said, well, I, so I'll have to try that. Bump, ba dum bump. Would you hit the button, please, on that you note of triumph? I'll fly me, I'm gonna fly you like I've never been flown before. <laughs> Yeah, fly Jennifer's day coach excursion fare to Miami and save a big 25% off the regular round trip fare. Hey, <laughs> cute little Jennifer. Fly Jennifer. It's only $181 round trip to Miami and you'll never forget it. Fly National. Fly me. <laughs> Did that pretty good, huh? Well, let's see. Uh, can you get away next week? You're going to have to forget Jennifer for a moment there. She's unforgettable, but uh, you know, what the heck. You can enjoy the vacation buy of the lifetime. The M.S. Mikhail Lermontov sails from New York on the 24th of June for an eight-day cruise to Bermuda. And you can have this eight days all for only 275 bucks a person. That's a full eight days, and that includes tip Rooney's. It's the Mikhail Lermontov. M.S. Mikhail Lermontov is both relaxing and exciting. What does M.S. stand for? I mean, I know what USS stands for and HMS, but what does MS stand for? Majesty ship something? I don't know. Anyway, uh, it's the Lermontov, and it's a beautiful ship from all the uh, information I can get on it. They have pools. They have uh, uh, they have all kinds of dancing. Deck chairs are free. There's even a nursery and all that. So it sounds great. $275 for a big trip. Eight-day cruise to Bermuda, including tips. And if you want the best cabin on the ship, it's 390 a person. But you have to act now. Sales the 24th for an eight-day Bermuda cruise. So give them a call. That's uh, 212-938-9300. That's 212-area-938-9300. Or your travel agent. Say you want to go on the Lermontoff. A critic once said that there's a touch of Runyon, a touch of Hemingway, and a touch of the poet in all he writes. Only one contemporary American writer fits that description. His name is Jimmy Breslin. Yes, there's only one Jimmy Breslin, and right now there's only one place in the metropolitan area you can read Jimmy Breslin regularly. In Newsday, the Long Island newspaper. For the next six weeks, a series of special articles by Breslin will appear in Newsday three times a week. In the news section on weekdays and in the ideas section of Sunday Newsday. If you enjoyed Breslin's commentary in the past, get ready for a new twist. Now it's Jimmy Breslin writing from Washington. Six weeks of colorful reports on the Washington scene by one of America's most exciting writers. The kind of special journalism you expect from one of America's leading newspapers. 
Jimmy Breslin. A special bonus for the next six weeks, only in Newsday. Long Island's own newspaper. All righty. All right. So you want to hear about the rest? No, you don't want to hear about the rest of that golf round, do you? I'll tell you this, though. Uh, it was the only time in my life I ever actually won anything playing golf. Yeah, you know, it was they, they, they did it on the basis of the score that the foursome got. And that's kind of nice when you got big guns going for you. Oh, boy. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, speaking of, of champions, the only other time that I was ever involved with a true champion was really a great scene. Uh, I was in Ireland, and uh, Ireland uh, is a lot of, like any other country, Ireland is uh, highly, uh, I suppose, uh, personal. If you go to, say, India, what you get on India it depends entirely on your head. Uh, it does not depend on what kind of uh, pictures you take with your Kodachrome slides and stuff. Uh, so it, it, it's extremely personal. Now, when I went to Ireland, I, I happened to be uh, into horses, you know, uh, uh, kind of casually, not, not a fanatic. Uh, I dig it, but yet, on the other hand, uh, I'm, I've never been a fanatic. Um <laughs> what I'm about to tell you probably would drive a fanatic up the wall because, uh, you know, a fanatic would say, oh, my God. So, uh, nevertheless, by the way, please don't uh, write me that letter. So, uh, <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> there's always somebody writing a letter. You're too fine a person. Uh, well, I'm not too fine a person. You don't know anything about me. But, uh, no, I'm really uh, depraved. But, uh, n oh, yes, decadent uh, right there. Why do you think that I have... Uh, sub, let's say, a subterranean, subliminal appeal, because I reflect the decadence of our time, almost like a mirror image. You know, I'm, I, I frankly admit that I dig uh, Mac, Big Macs, and uh, you know, I sit and watch bad, rotten television when a bad, rotten movie isn't available. And, uh, you know, <laughs> so what the heck? So, uh, nevertheless, uh, I'm over in Ireland, see, and. Uh, among other things, uh, uh, you know, I, how much time do I have, Dave? Please, quick. Seven minutes. Okay, I'll give you a tip. Uh, if you're if you're if you're looking for something really interesting to do this year, I think it's a little late for the spring show. Uh, there are two things to go to uh, that I find fantastic in Europe. One of them is the spring show in Dublin, which is uh, held uh, very early in the spring. I think it's around the uh, the first two weeks of May, roughly, so we've missed that. But the spring show is like Ireland's all, let's say the entire country of Ireland's combined county fair. It's like if you took uh, a national fair, really. We don't have any, any parallel in this country at all to it. But uh, the, the uh, spring show is one week, and it's, it's a fantastic thing, right in the middle of Dublin, in this great, big, uh, beautiful, ancient uh, arena, uh, this ancient park uh, called the Royal Dublin Enclosure. Actually, it's called the Royal Dublin Society Grounds, but the enclosure is within it, you see. The enclosure is where they, where they do the events. And uh, all around it is this ancient ground, and it's all Victorian. It's, uh, it goes back to roughly uh, the last uh, quarter century of Victoria's reign. It is truly Victorian. And it's exactly the way it was, except they've wired it for electricity. And that's about it. And uh, these ancient buildings, and these old, uh, and they're beautiful. They're all magnificently maintained. And uh, trees and, and uh, great fields around, right in the middle of town. There's these fields all around it and trees. And, and uh, you can smell the, uh, the animals that are there. It's just a great feeling. And that's the spring show. That's in the first couple of weeks of May. And then late in August, and this is something else, man, is the Royal, the RDS, which is the capper to the, uh, to the continental horse shows over the entire year of horse shows. That is, the begin early in the spring, uh, go all the way through places like Aachen, uh, places like Brussels, uh, the, the, the famous uh, horse shows in Germany. And of course, the, the international teams uh, go to these various horse shows. They're sent there by their country and so on. We're one of the very few countries, by the way, that does not nationally support its international jumping team. It's supported by individual contributions. So you go to Germany, and that's a German team. Uh, you know, Germany provides the money. The Irish uh, team is an Irish national team. It's provided by monies from Ireland. This is also true of the 
the Italian team and so on. But we, we ours are strictly uh, uh, U.S. Uh, jumpers, and uh, it's all private funds. And, in fact, even the horses are owned by private people who loan them to the team. Uh, or, if, in case of people who are really benevolent, they give them to the team. But they're magnificent international jumpers. And so uh, late in uh, the summer, which is the best time of the year as far as weather is concerned in Ireland, uh, in August, say, roughly, I, I, I think it's August the 4th. Last year it was. It's around that uh, period. Uh, for one week, the RDS takes over, and that is fantastic. Uh, all the jumping teams from the continent come and uh, it's uh, it's really if you want if you're looking for true color this is truly it all the farmers for example of all of all Ireland have arrived with their uh, prize donkey which uh, they are showing yeah they have shows in all the different uh, arenas they 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 show donkeys they show uh, uh all kinds of trotting horses they show carriage horses they show and this is a big competition for these people <laughs> and they're, they're they're wild looking people too i might add because uh, these guys are coming from places where for like uh, the entire year prior to this the one week they spend in dublin they haven't even seen an electric light you know they live in a house that's covered with peat and uh you know they have a kerosene lamp and they come into town with their prize bull or something so here it is the Royal Dublin Show, and then the the final day of the RDS is the Ambassadors Cup, which is, or rather, the Nations Cup, which is provided by, of course, Ireland, and they have the Royal uh, Army Band out there, and the Premier, and the President, and the whole scene, and the flags are flying, and these teams are jumping in this enclosure. It's just a great sight. Every one of them, by the way, wearing their own individual colors. Obviously, the Irish team wears a green jacket. Uh, the U.S. team, by the way, wears a bright hunting pink, what they call, well, you would call it red. Uh, they call that a hunting pink. And it's, uh, it has a blue sort of a flash collar on it and white, uh, white jodhpurs. That's the U.S. jumping colors with the black, uh, with the black jumping hat. And they're very elegant with a big shield on the, uh, on the, uh, on the, on the, uh, right on the pockets. A great big U.S. shield, you know. And uh, you'd be surprised how patriotic all of a sudden you feel. When these guys come out, you know, there's four or five riders come out there and these great horses, and they're, they're with the Italian team and the German team, and the world champion is always a German, you know, and they come out there, and the crowd cheers, and they play the Star Spangled Banner. Wow, you know, <laughs> especially last year when uh, an unbelievable upset, an 18-year-old U.S. rider beat the world champion for the, the cup, the Irish, uh, the nation's cup, which is, you know, unbelievable. And a fantastic jump off, and the crowd was out of his bird. Well, that that week, I had my involvement with a champion. I was out in the countryside later, about two days later, and uh, this friend of mine who was into horses says, you want to go riding? And I said, do I want to go riding? Of course, see. So uh, I was sent out to this place out in the country, outside of a town called Ennis, where uh, they had a magnificent stable, fantastic stable of uh, of about 150 Irish jumpers of all kinds. These are all thoroughbreds, by the way. And uh, the best Irish jumpers, uh, well, in all of Ireland. And Ireland uh, jumpers are just the best, see. And so I, I arrived out there, and this guy was waiting. A great big guy looked a little bit like Gary Cooper, but uh, with a raunchy Irish accent. I said, uh, I'm ready to ride. He says, uh, you can ride? And I said, yeah, I, I, you know, I can stay on him. So with that, they, they, they bring out the biggest, most impressive horse. Seriously, the single most impressive horse I've ever seen in my life. It was snow white and 17 and a half hands high. Now, if you don't know that much about that, this is a horse that makes, well, it, it dwarfs Wilt Chamberlain. And, 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 you know, I'm looking up at this horse. He's flicking his head. And five minutes later, I'm out in the field on this horse, which, by the way, had been a national jumping champ, champion. And uh, what a fantastic horse, you know. And, and you know, this is a champion, see, and I'm, I'm hanging on the back there. And uh, we're moving along, and I'm riding. And the guy says, uh, just, uh, he says, uh, quite, uh, quite uh, soft on the mouth. And I says, yes. And just a little flick, you know, and the horse moves. He just knows what he's doing, see. And we're, we're going out, and the rain is coming down, and, and the, all that Irish green all around, and there's a flock of sheep to the left of us, and the bull looking real mad. 
steps with the undergrowth at us to the right. The horse is looking at the bull. And we just move on through that countryside and says, my God, this is a real champ. <laughs> and by the way, this horse has appeared on the cover of Vogue. This horse has photo been photographed in dozens of pictures. In fact, this horse was this horse used by Richard Burton in one of the Shakespearean films that they made. Unbelievable horse. Ah, oh, you know, you got to go first class if you're going to go, you know. This is WOR New York. Stay tuned for In Conversation.